Kenya has been made beautiful and it's made fair seeming to people, but it's not. It actually is a challenge and a test. Can you keep yourself clean? Your faith was revealed by Allah in order to cleanse your connection with Him, in order to cleanse your entire life, in order to make sure you're a clean person from every aspect. When you worship, you worship Allah alone. Cleanliness in worship. When you are doing your actions, you do them in the purest possible way as per the teachings of Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When you interact with one another, you have a clean relationship, no deception, no abuse, no vulgarity. All of that is part of what makes you a beautiful person. So shaitan comes and beautify things. A lot of others are doing this. Let me just do it. It's okay. Those are my friends. Never mind. I go to school with them. Not everyone you go to school with is your friend. Remember that. Not everyone who goes to, sc to school with you is your buddy. They might just be a colleague or an acquaintance or a workmate, but you need to know where to draw the line and when. If they have bad habits that are really affecting them or they will disturb the relationship and connection with Allah, then obviously you might take good from them in terms of perhaps them being a colleague assisting you physically for something permissible, but you're not going to take a bad habit from them. You're not going to take distraction from them for Allah. Imagine Allah says in the Quran quite clearly when he speaks about intoxicants being an abomination. When he speaks about gambling, then he says all this is the handiwork of the devil. Are you going to leave it or not? Meaning you have to, you should, you must. Allah says, Innama yuridu shaytanu an yuqi'a baynakumul adawata wal baghda'a fil khamri wal maysir wa yasuddakum an dhikri allahi wa an salam he tells you what shaitan wants from you by getting you involved in intoxicants and gambling. He says shaitan wants to create between you enmity and hatred and he wants to distract you from the remembrance of Allah and from your prayer. That's shaitan's aim. What does he want? He wants hatred between us. He wants enmity between us. And he wants to distract us from the remembrance of Allah, which means we are no longer conscious of Allah in any way. Because when we say dhikrullah, it is not only referring to subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar. It is far beyond that. It refers to remembering Allah, bearing Allah in mind, being conscious of Allah. That is a part of the dhikr of Allah. And then... He wants to distract you as a result from prayer because the prayer is a shield between you and the devil. I always tell young men or women who come to me for advice, please can you give us one piece of advice? I say, can I throw in one more? Let's make it two. Number one, have good friends. Have good friends. Make sure you have brilliant friends and more important than that, make sure you are a good friend to those around you. Because it's easy to say, oh, I'm looking for good friends, but you, you, you yourself are not even bothered about your own habits. You don't even pray. You're not interested in what goes into your mouth, out of your mouth. Everything is just okay. Subhanallah, if that's the case, my brother, my sister, my beloved child, I am telling you, you need to make sure you are a good friend to those around you and then make sure that those around you are good friends as well. I've said this in the past, the quick test of knowing whether you are in good company or they are in your good company or the opposite whether you're in bad company or good is as follows if your good habits are brushing off onto them such that they're eradicating or minimizing the bad they're in and coming towards the good you are in they are in good company you follow that and if any one of their bad habits is influencing you so your goodness is diminishing, that means you are in bad company. Simple as that. So shaitan's plan is to distract you. Shaitan's plan is to get you involved in intoxicants. And that's why we say, what do you need to put rolled up, crushed tobacco to your lips for? 
I was sitting with a group of friends. They left me a few moments ago. Where did they go? Someone says, they just went out to have a puff. Allahu Akbar, my buddies, you're still here, right? May Allah grant us ease. May Allah make it easy for you to quit even a simple cigarette because it's not as simple as you think it is. I always say, imagine it's illegal to sell simple cigarettes. I said, it's not so simple. Let me explain why. Illegal to sell it without writing on it, smoking kills. Am I right or wrong? Smoking kills. Now, how legal do you think it is from an Islamic perspective if it is illegal to actually sell it to you from a worldly perspective without warning you about it? I'm a Muslim. I'm a mu'min. My faith has taught me to be disciplined. Islam is a religion of discipline. That's the reason why those who don't like to be disciplined do not like Islam. They don't want to be told. In Islam, we want to be told. Please tell me. I will thank you when you correct me. That's a difference. That's a Muslim. When you're told and the person is correct, as much as you might not have liked the way they said things, if they are right, take it. Even if you're silent about it, but you say, you know what, deep down, you know, hey, this brother was right, this sister was right. You know, they, I'm not saying we should just be blunt with everyone and anyone. When you want to correct someone, there is a method of doing it. Many of the young say that, you know what, I don't mind changing, but you know, some of these scholars, they just blast us. They blast us. You know what? It's the way they said it. It's okay. Take it in your stride. Were you wrong? Yes, you were. Well, then that was Allah sending someone to just tell you things. Might not have been the way you want it to be, subhanallah. Sometimes medication is bitter. It's bitter. But it will help you. <laughs> so, subhanallah, if something lacks discipline in it, you need to remember. From an Islamic perspective, most likely, you will have to fine-tune yourself to ensure you are within what is disciplined. All rules and regulations, why? To make you a better person. You need to be sane all the time. You need to get up at a certain time, sleep at a certain time, speak in a certain way, spend some time of the day with your Quran because you have to do that. The message of Allah that comes through Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to us, what importance have you given it in your life? You know what is strange? We face reality. We would become crazy if anyone were to insult Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yet we are lacking in our own following of the same Nabi of Allah. Isn't that also a type of an insult? I say he is the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but do I really consider him a messenger in reality? Or is it just okay? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, oh, he's the messenger, he's the messenger. Wallahi, I ask you a question. If he were to meet you now, right now, right here, would you be embarrassed? Or would it be okay? Well, you might think I'm sitting in an Islamic lecture. It would be good. It would be actually very nice, right? When we walk out of here, we go back home tomorrow, when there's a holiday, the weekend and so on, how we carry ourselves. Imagine if the Nabi of Allah had to pass by and just see you from a distance, would you be able to associate and affiliate and say, hey, there's our Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, would you be happy to rush and run towards him? You got to answer that on your own. I want to tell you a fact. Allah is watching day and night. You cannot run away from Allah. And Allah is the highest, the creator, the maker, the cherisher, the sustainer, the provider, the protector. Whatever you want on earth, He is the owner of it. You've got to go through Him. It is Him who will give it to you. You want a job? Ask Allah. You don't need to do something haram to get that. The owner of it, if He's closed the door, it means it's not a good thing. So don't stress. Allah will give you whatever is written for you. Strive, work hard towards achieving it. Whether you get it or not is in the hands of Allah. So my brothers, my sisters, your faith, it's absolutely important to protect it. But how will you protect it when you don't know it? So therefore you need to learn. You need to learn about it. One talk is not going to do you that much of good. It will motivate you. It will move you. You will have the urge to do something about it. Within 48 hours, if you haven't done something about it, chances are you're not going to do anything about it. We meet next year. You say, I met you last year. It was a good talk, mashallah. What did you do about it? Well, I was waiting for this year so that you could come back and talk to us. Mashallah, is that what it is? Subhanallah.
That's not what it is. You gave a good talk. Do you know what I did? I immediately enrolled for this and for that. I started going to the masjid. I started doing my salah. I changed my life. I did this. I did that. And you know, today I'm in a position where I feel I still need to do more and more. Subhanallah. That's the beauty of Islam. When you have true faith in your heart, it will always make you feel like you're not good enough. You need to do more knowing that you've achieved a lot. For you to be here at this particular venue for this particular reason is already a big deal in the sense that you paid something in order to come to hire a venue of this nature to make it possible for a large group of people to come and hear something that would draw you closer to Allah. You knew that the theme is facing reality. You knew that we are going to listen to scholars and so on. Allah says, we tailor made it for you. It was never meant to miss your ears. If you heard me say something today, it was going to hit your ears, come what may. It's written for you, it's meant for you. How are you going to process that? Wallahi, there should be love in the hearts of every one of us towards all of us. In the sense that one to another, we should be feeling for each other. The greatest feeling is when you see someone do something wrong, don't just try to push them further down. Think of ways of how you can reach the person in order to empower them with the correct knowledge and ask Allah to guide them. Because guidance is not in my hands, nor yours. It's in the hands of Allah. Let's face reality. Today when we see someone do something wrong, what do we do? What do we do? Well, we are quick to broadcast it. That's the minimum, isn't it? Quick to tell the world, watch out, this guy, I saw him with what? I saw him with something. <laughs> it looked a bit like, I don't know what it looks like anyway. What does it look like? If you know, you're guilty, because none of us know, right? But to be honest with you, we are quick to broadcast, but that's your brother in Dean. Uh, why do you want to broadcast? If you really have love in your heart, you will immediately have a feeling of sadness to say, I saw my sister do this. How on earth can I reach them in a beautiful way to convince them that you know what? You need the mercy of Allah. You know, when I was young, we used to be beaten. Go to madrasa, beaten. Come home, beaten. Go to school, beaten. Do whatever, beaten. Okay, maybe uh, mine wasn't that bad, I mean, personally. But I'm saying that's how, that was the norm. So no one wanted to read the Quran as much as they should have. I'm not saying they didn't, but it's not as much as they should have. People didn't want to do this. They didn't want to do that. Anywhere a child went or a young adult went and they were made to feel like they were not good enough, they immediately started withdrawing. So you have the Islamic lectures, five or ten people are there. You have, and people say, no, it's only the sincere who come. It's only those who are sincere. It's not about numbers. We agree it's not about numbers. But my concern is how do I reach the people who don't want to come? I remember getting up in the masjid years back and saying, my brothers, we need to pray. We need to come to the masjid. An uncle got up and told me, Sheikh, you know what? You got to tell that to the guys who are outside because we're all here anyway. I felt like a fool because he was right. He was right. Sitting in the masjid telling the brothers, we need to come to the masjid. They're already in the masjid. You need to probably give them some guidance to remind them to make it a habit and not to miss and not to lose out on what they have and probably to build on it. But your concern will be only genuine when you think about how can I get to those in the pubs and the clubs, those who are far away from the deen of Allah. So let me tell you, let's face reality. When I make you feel a sense of identity and I give you that sense of belonging and I make you feel like, you know what, we're all struggling in different ways, but we're all one family. We care for you. We love you. We will respect you with that honor and dignity. We will remind you what happens. You can relate. You can relate to this person because you know what? They don't just push me aside and say, you know what? You're living in another world. We're living in another world. That was the attitude. And so when you hear them, when you see them, you feel a connection because they cared for you. So each one of us needs to do that to the others so that they, they feel that we're part of one big family here. When you correct someone, please be careful because in the real world, people are out there to do you down, to drop you, to see your downfall. They would be excited to see your downfall. Any small thing, they are waiting 
with a pen and a paper, and not even that, they're probably, whatever it might be, they're waiting for you to make one, one blunder in order to cancel you. Because we're living in an age of cancellation. But I tell you, a true mu'min, a true believer, is waiting for one opportunity to take off that cancellation and bring you back and say, hey, come on, man. We're brothers, we're sisters. We're part of one family. I know you're struggling. You know what? You know what you need to do and what you should stay away from. Imagine if I came here and I started reciting and reading what's halal and what's haram, and I stopped at that. I tell you what, chances are most of us already know what's halal and haram, but we need encouragement to stay away from haram and to do that which is halal and to fulfill your obligation unto Allah. I sit and I watch and I read. And when I read the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says, Raka'ata al-fajri khayrum min dunya wa ma fiha. That's one of my favorite ahadith because it moves me. We all like nice things. You like a good scent. You love lovely clothes. It's normal. It's okay. You love a beautiful vehicle. You see something nice. You, mashallah, tabarakallah. Don't just go and say, wow. You gotta say, mashallah, alhamdulillah, tabarakallah, Allahumma barik, whatever. There are so many uh, duas. You, you, we need to learn them. We need to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the same time, you see all those beautiful things the hadith is telling you. The two units of sunnah read just before the obligation of Fajr better than the whole world and whatever it contains for you. Hey, now in the morning, you tell yourself, Subhanallah, I'm getting up. Do you know why? Wallahi, all those things that I've ever thought of and seen and loved and liked and whatever it may be, the scents and the clothes and the, you know, the designer names and some of those names are dodgy, by the way. They're really, really dodgy, by the way. All of that put on one side And I just put the two units of prayer on the other It's heavier, it's more Come on, come on For me, these two units are far more valuable I'm a believer Allah, if Allah has placed such value upon an act of worship Remember, it must be so, so, so important and valuable in His eyes He wants to discipline you And on top of that, He wants to be worshipped in that way Give it to Him He made you from nothing I always ask people who say, I'm doubting my maker. I said, well, where were you? Where were you two years before you were born? And then they begin to answer and they start, some get technical, some say, I don't know, and so on. I tell you something, you were in the wombs of your mothers at a certain point, a few months before you were born. Do you remember anything there? No, I don't. Anyone here? Please put up your hand. Remember, womb of your mother? Yeah, tell us how it was. Nah, no one raised their hands, don't worry. Because you can't. But imagine if you were in there and you had an understanding. I'm presuming perhaps there must have been a time when I really was warm, enjoying myself, you know, protected from the outside world by being in, uh, surrounded by a liquid that also was nutritious to me when I needed and at the same time protective and warm and, uh, you know, no matter how cold it was outside, I was okay and so much more. And I started growing and mashallah, tabarakallah, so well, so protected, enjoying every bit of it. And then you start feeling you can't move anymore. You can't move anymore. Between you and a totally different world and life is just a membrane. That of the womb of your mother. That's it. You would never be able to imagine for a moment, you would never be able to imagine what was waiting for you outside. But between you and that was just a membrane. And one day, just as you might have thought that, you know what, this is getting too much. Allah Almighty chose your time and date and place of birth. You were born. When you were born, what happened? You came into a real, this real world that we see right now. But Allah still calls this a deception. Wow. What did you cross? You crossed a membrane. By crossing a membrane, you came into something. Your lungs suddenly filled with air. You began to cry. Subhanallah. Hadith speaks about the poking of the devil. He says, hey, one more customer. He has one more customer. We're going to work on this guy as well. Subhanallah. Started crying. Right? If you didn't, it seems like you didn't cry. Did you cry? Yeah. 
If you didn't, they spanked you a little bit, mashallah, physical spanking. Just to make sure your lungs are, mashallah, opened and so on. You're breathing properly and whatever else. I promise you, my beloved brothers and sisters, between us, and the akhirah is a membrane, a different type of a membrane, but as thin, if not even thinner, than what there was there. Don't be deceived by someone telling you there's no hereafter. Where I was prior to my birth, well before my birth, centuries and wherever, whatever it was prior to my birth, wallahi, I'm going to go back to a place that will be far more sophisticated. This world is sophisticated enough. Today I'm looking at you. I'm seeing you. I can hear you. I have feelings. I have emotions. I'm speaking to you. I'd like to spend maybe a little bit more time with you. Not possible because this world is finite. I'm very sure that if I were to drop dead right here, right now, may Allah grant us Jannah and take us away whenever He knows it's best for us to go. I swear I'm going to go to a place where I know my Lord has made something far better than all of this here. That's why the hadith speaks about the hereafter and Jannah. And it says, Speak of paradise. In it there is that which no eyes have ever seen, no ears have ever heard. It hasn't even crossed the mind of any one of you. You know, the term qalbi bashar is used, the heart of anyone. It hasn't even crossed your heart. Let's word it that way. So if you've heard something, sorry, what you're going to get there is far better. If you've seen something, what you're going to get there is far better. As a woman keeps looking at the husband, he says, why? He says, so that I know you're not going to be there. So that's not how it works. The same dude will probably be there, but subhanallah, when you see him, say, ah, you, wow, you look so handsome, mashallah, amazing. Yeah, and as you're thinking, you know what? Allah Almighty gives you exactly how you want at that particular time, at that time. I swear a lot of us are so connected to our pets, we'd probably be making more dua for our pets to be with us than our spouses. Does it not happen? I see the men were not too happy with what I just said. Allah grant ease. Nonetheless, let's get a bit more serious. My brothers, my sisters, we have to work towards that. The distractions of the dunya are such that they might even make us question our own faith. But the reason why you don't have the answers is you did not make an effort to learn from the correct sources. So you don't have the answer. Someone asked you a simple question and you feel knocked out. That's because you never invested in your own faith. We're telling you tonight, invest in it. Learn, read. Don't let people snatch that away from you. The world is filled with distraction. That's what we call it, distraction. What does it distract you from? It distracts you from the main focus that's your maker. The one who made you is telling you, all I want from you is worship me alone. That's it. And I have asked you to be disciplined in a certain way. The way that I want that discipline is taught to you by the messenger I sent to you, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So listen to it. The problem is we don't know it, we don't want to know it. Small question and we feel so, you know, deflated. Oh, I have a question, you know. I really, I want to know uh, this particular thing. Why and how? How come Islam allows this and how come that? Look, it's okay to ask in order to know. But sometimes when you have never made an effort to learn things, people might ask it to you in a way that they may be trying to imply that you're following a faith that doesn't make sense. And then, because you never ever made an effort to learn, you might start thinking that. That's the reality on the ground. Notice how all of this goes back to learning, knowledge, study. Go to the masjid. I swear that will change your life. Join some halakat, some little group. It might be a little bit inconvenient. One or two people might be loud or soft. Some people might ask a few questions more than others. You know, people become very personal. Oh, mashallah, the one of the sisters was telling me that she joined the halaqa. And when she joined the halaqa, there was this one sister that kept asking her, how much does your watch cost? Oh, what makeup are you wearing? But that's not what I came for. And you know, oh, your shoes, wow, where did you get them from? Oh, okay, I see you got this car. What does your husband do? And so on. Come on, I came for a halaqa to learn Quran. I told her sister, just go barefoot. You're not supposed to have worn makeup anyway. Just wear one nice cloak, cover yourself head to toe, clear your throat every little time, every little while. Subhanallah. But that's not how it should be. 
Let's make people feel comfortable. I tell some of the brothers who go to the masjid regularly, when you see someone not so regular come to the masjid, make them feel at home. Make sure you go out of your way to welcome them. And don't overdo it that they feel like, you know, this guy is now sort of, you know, overdoing this with me. But salam alaikum, good to see you, nice to see you, etc. And they come forth and they feel that connection. That's how you build a brotherhood. The same should happen to the sisters. You meet each other today. We don't know who's sitting next to us. Are you going to take a moment before we leave to greet the person next to you and at least ask them their name? Don't ask them, oh, where do you work? What do you do? And so, you know, I, I, I like the scent of your perfume. Some of the brothers, you know why? Because the other day someone asked me, I like the scent of your perfume. I took it out. I said, you know what? You can have it, brother. Brother, you can have it. Yalla. You can take it. Yeah. He got it without asking, without even smelling it, without even saying what it was. But that's how it is. Every time I put something in my pocket, I tell myself, I hope I go home. Before I go home, I just want to give it away to someone. Mashallah. That's why I don't carry so much cash. <laughs> but my brothers and sisters, this is the deen of Allah that we're talking about, facing reality. It's being snatched from under our feet. And you know what? We're not even noticing. Have we become regular? If we have, have we learned? Are we passing the baton to the next generation? Do we encourage people to learn? And I tell you what the scholars are in their dozens. Select someone who is genuine, authentic, who teaches you the Quran and the Sunnah and speaks in a way that's palatable to you. Perhaps someone who encourages and motivates you to go beyond where you are, but keep it going. Do not stop. And don't get, don't get stuck because someone said something, someone said something about another, someone said something about you, someone said something about that, they will always talk. From the beginning they've spoken, right up to the end they will speak. The minute you have something good, people have to talk about you. They must say things. The minute, you know, you, for example, it's not prohibited to have a lovely motor vehicle, right? I'm sure every one of us, I tweeted about it today, we all would love to have a nice car or something, a, a, a nice house. We all have our aim, you know, our eyes are set on something. I'm going to get a better job, a better salary, a better house, a better car. What else? Okay, these guys are just looking at me like, uh -uh, don't say it. Okay, fine. Fair enough. For as long as halal, it's okay. I promise you it's okay to be focused on that to a degree for as long as your primary focus is, I want to have a better relationship with Allah. Because if you've had nothing of all of that and you've had a good relationship with Allah or a better and you're improving as the days pass, wallahi, it's a sign of the mercy of Allah.